book. It's the type of book you go to to look up information. And uh, they have a one-volume set now. Originally, it was in two volumes, volume one, volume two. It's by Josh McDowell. The newest edition, his son has given some information in relationship to that, too. So it's now by Josh and Sean McDonald. And you can get a hardback edition of that on um, CBD. Um, not the marijuana oil, but the Christian book distributors. <laughs> um, Christian book distributors has one, I think, for somewhere around $35, hardback edition, if you want a new one. Uh, but there are a lot of sites that you can go to and, and get a used one. Uh, and so I would, I just Gary mentioned it this morning, and I think it's one of the best books you can buy uh, as a believer to have uh, for a reference book in your library. So if you don't have that, consider consider getting one of those. Again, it's called, I think the new one is actually new evidence. And if not, just look up for evidence that demands a verdict. But get the one volume set, over 750 pages. Um, but it covers things like fulfilled prophecy, manuscript evidence for the New Testament, manuscript evidence for the Old Testament, why do we believe Christianity is the one true religion, why do we believe in a God, all sorts of topics that a lot of people question, and uh, it, it has some really, really good, thoroughly researched answers, well documented as well, it's got all sorts of footnotes, uh, so you can check original sources. And with that, then, let me... Uh, uh, mentioned that we're proud, we're proud, we're happy, I shouldn't say proud, but we're, we, are, we are glad that they are a part of our congregation. Larry and Hilda have been attending here for about eight years. Larry's been preaching um, for forever, <laughs> <laughs> for a long time. He's been pastor in several churches. He's still serving oftentimes as an interim pastor. In fact, just last year, wasn't it, over at First Baptist of Hudson? Yeah, sure. Was it, um, the pastor over there, Pastor Steve? If I remember correctly, he um, had some sort of surgery or something, and we were filling in for him. And uh, so uh, he, we, I've been trying to figure out a time uh, when he could preach here, and I, I kept po sort of postponing and postponing. Finally, I just said to him there, I said, let's just schedule a date when you can share the word with us here at Grace. So this morning, uh, it's my pleasure to announce or to introduce to you uh, Larry. And Hilda, would you stand for just a second so everybody knows who you are? Uh, this is a beautiful life. Hilda. And I didn't, I didn't know that you were Dutch, Hilda. I, I didn't know. I should have guessed that from the name. And, and then Larry told us this morning that if you're not Dutch, you're not much. So <laughs> we're glad you're here as well. Thank you, Larry. You know, I, I'm glad you had her stand because she threatened me if I asked her to stand. So. Is that on? Yeah. yeah. I, think, no, I think so, the green light. Dean? Yes. Is this, this on? Where yes. It should be? Okay. That's good. All right, I'm, I'm double wired this morning. I count it a privilege to be able to be here and share from the Word today. I just, I thank you, uh, Pastor, for the opportunity and for the privilege. It's just been a real joy. You know, Pastor Dean sent out a couple of uh, emails with, uh, you know, telling we're going to speak. And then Brian uh, McIntyre uh, put it on the uh, uh, RV Park Facebook page. I thought, oh man, I thought... I looked at that and I thought, I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. So, we are. You know, I, Sean, I guess Sean sneaked out of here already, didn't he? But, you know, I, um, I heard that one day uh, Joanna said, uh, Sean, why don't you grow a mustache? And, uh, and uh, he said, do we have to do everything together? <laughs> that was nasty, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, that, that's enough of that. Let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to John chapter 21. We're going to talk about eight words that can change your life. John chapter 21. Um, we're going to start at verse 15. I would like to read, have you follow along if you would, please. John chapter 21, verses 15 through 23. Give you just a moment. So when they'd eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished, but 
when you're old, you will stretch out your hands. And that, that is, that is a, a kind of a reference to the way he's going to die, basically, on the cross. So we go on, stretch out your hands. Another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Then he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And that's what we just read. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, that would be John, who also leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrayed, uh, Lord, who is the one who betrayed, let me, let me go back again, whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him he would not die, but what he said was, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? What is that to you? We're going to zero in on those few words in a few moments. In verse 22 there we have a question and a command. What is that to you? And then the command is, you follow me. Eight words. I think it could change our lives. We're going to build on that this morning. But let's go back to a little bit earlier uh, portion of the scripture. Now remember, Peter had recently denied the Lord Jesus three times. Three times. And when the rooster crowed, recorded for us in Luke chapter 22, verse 62, it says, then Peter went out and he wept bitterly. He went out and he wept bitterly. True metanoia, true repentance and sorrow taking place. And what I find interesting at the tomb then, those that were gathered there, the Lord Jesus looked at them and he said, now, now and go tell Peter also, tell Peter what? That I have arisen from the grave. Isn't that grace? Peter denied Christ and he said, he, he singled him out and go tell Peter, let Peter know what has taken place already that I have been risen from the dead. You know, the disciples had left all to follow Jesus. Now, verse 3, go back there for just a moment as we continue to prepare our, our way for the primary text. Simon Peter said to him, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out immediately. They got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. I don't suppose anybody fishing ever done that, right? But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in at the little boat, for not far from the land. So we'll, we'll, we'll stop there for now. But that night they caught nothing. And in verse 6, they're, as you know, they're instructed to cast the net out on the other side. So they did that, and you know the rest of the story. The net is filled, and, and John says, oh, it is the Lord. Peter's flabbergasted. He, he puts his outer garment uh, back on. He jumps into to the lake, and he swims ashore, uh, verse 7. And he couldn't wait to row, so he, he jumped in. You know, Peter's kind of impetuous. Have you noticed that? I can identify with Peter. Can you identify with Peter? I've often said, I said it in the earlier services, well, Peter had kind of a foot-shaped mouth, right? But he jumped in, and he was, he was just so thrilled to see the Lord Jesus. And in verse 15, they begin talking now. They begin this dialogue that we've read. And Jesus asked Peter three times, and we could build a whole message just on that. But he asked him three times, do you love me? And, you know, he says, yes, well, he said to him then, uh, Peter, first of all, he said, you love me more than these. The idea is that you love me, you love me more than anything. Or is this a love, a commitment, a for real love? And for three times, and, and Peter gets a little exasperated. He said, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. And, 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 and Jesus had used that word agapeo, which is, you know, we often think just the love of God. And it's only we love him. But it is, is a genuine love that we can exercise in our heart for others as well. Yes, do you love me? And at first Peter kind of says, kind of, well, yes, Lord, you know I like you. But finally he nails it down. Yes, Lord. And he gets frustrated because he asked him that three times. But nonetheless, what, he's, what Jesus is stressing to Peter, this is an intense love. 
You need to have that intense love. Put all things aside and love me more than these, these people, these, and you know, some of the, uh, some of the uh, commentators aren't sure what this means, but I think it means here that, Peter, do you love me more than anything else in your life, your ministry, your soul, your body? Do you love me? And Peter says, you know, he says, yes, yes. And then in verse 18, as we commented, that uh, he's now, uh, Jesus is not going to tell Peter, uh, this is going to be your ministry, and this is how you're going to die. Now, as I said, it's not real plain in the English, but he, when he says, stretch out your arms, it's, it's, it's the idea, he's telling him, you're going to the cross. You're going to go to the cross. You're going to be crucified. You're going to be crucified. And then he says, as he did originally back in Matthew 4.19, he said to Peter, follow me. Follow me. So he's following him. Now, Peter sees John in verse 21. And, and he says, Lord, what is this man going to do? Well, what, what is this John going to do? What is John's future? And Jesus, Jesus said what our text is. What is that to you? You follow me. By the way, as I said earlier, Peter failed, folks, but he was not a failure. That has encouraged me. We all fail. We all blow it. But God's grace, as we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us, and we can move on. Peter failed, but he was not a failure. Now, at our text, he, Jesus said, if it is my will that John never dies, it's not your concern. You know, follow me. Jesus was not being rude. He was teaching Peter, and he's teaching you, and he's teaching me. I want you to consider with me very quickly this morning three ways or ramifications of these eight words. Now, they're on the screen. Would you repeat them with me, please? What is that? I'm listening. What is that to you? You follow me. And I saw four of you do that. Let's, come on, let's. What is that to you? You follow me. All right. Now, first of all, let's consider the Lord's question. If you're allowing another person to keep you from serving the Lord, your believer, and are there others that keep you? What is that to you? There are five words right there, if understood and applied, could definitely change our lives. And this is a sensitive area, no doubt about it. So many look at others, and they fail. They fail. And, and, and hold others back. And we're held back sometimes when we look at others. I remember a number of years ago, and uh, we're being broadcast now, so I'll not give the name as I did the earlier service, but there was a dear man that uh, years ago, we were, I had, a, I had a, a travel trailer, and we were replacing, oh, about three square feet of the entryway of the floor had kind of rotted away, and so we were working together. And I, I was glad we had that opportunity. Uh, this man's family had attended the church, and he had been there the years I was there. He'd only been there once or twice. And we, we got to chatting, and, uh, and I, you know, I, he said he'd even years before that, he said he'd even asked to become a deacon. I never realized that. As we talked, I, I, I saw there was no reality. This man was saved. He had trusted Christ as a Savior, and I'm so glad he, to, to know that because several years later, I did have his funeral. But I said, now, now what happened? What, what caused you? He, said, he kind of hung his head and almost in shame. And he, he really meant it. He said, I watched other people. I was focusing on other people. And these other people, they, they let me down. They let me down and, and I focused on them. He said, there, there was a pastor that, that they had to let go. I focused on him. And, and I just, I got so sidetracked. And he acknowledged that, that he had failed. You know, folks, it's not a cliche. Jesus never fails. We need to keep our eyes focused. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know, again, we can fasten our eyes on other people, and they will let us down. And I'm repeating myself. I know that reality is Jesus never fails. So many become shipwrecked looking to others. As I mentioned in the earlier service, remember years ago, there were several different TV pastors that really went down the tubes. They really messed up morally. And I can remember Hilda and I, it's my wife, going out and making calls in various homes. And these people would say, you know, they'd look at us and say, See, that's what Christians, see these preachers, that's what it's all about. I don't want anything else to do. They watch them, and they fail. They messed up. Other, they caused other people to wipe them out. 
But what is that to you? Follow me. You know, each of us are accountable for our own sin. And those who cause others to become shipwrecked will be judged. They'll pay for that. Now, please hear me. Focus on what God has planned for you. In the life of God has tremendous plans for us. Remember Jeremiah 29, 11? Remember that great verse? For I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. A future and a hope. A personal question. Is someone keeping you from Christ, their salvation, or maybe uh, you're keeping, you're not following the Lord Jesus Christ because of someone else's lifestyle. You've looked at them. Now the book of Leviticus, way back in, in, in the Old Testament, speaks about the importance of, of keeping our eyes focused on Christ. Leviticus 19.16 says, you should, now this is, this, is, this is just part of the whole thing here. Uh, tail bearers, gossiping could be something that really causes people to, uh, to, to fail. Leviticus 19.16 says, You should not go about as a tail bearer among people. Proverbs 25.18 says, A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. A club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. And you know, just visualize, visualize this. On your forehead, in large letters, it's marked or tattooed. It says, holiness unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. You look in the mirror. Ladies, you're putting on your lipstick and your mascara and all that. Oh, by the way, if the barn needs painted, ladies, go ahead and paint it. That's all right. Okay. But they're looking in the mirror you see holiness unto the Lord. You go out into public, and there's a rude clerk. You ever have one of those? You want to keep it in mind, though. Sometimes they may have some rough things going on. I gave one of those little cards one time that Ray Pritchard uh, gives, has made available. It says, uh, uh, keep calm, Jesus is in the boat. I handed it to a lady one day, and the tears ran down her cheeks. She said, that's what I need. So we do need to keep in mind that sometimes there's a lot of stress the way people may respond to us. But how about that, 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 that rude driver? I remember in our area, well, before we moved from where we're at now, uh, near Okemos, Michigan, there was actually a road rage that took place. A man jumped out of his car and shot and killed two people, 13 miles from my home. Road rage. People are angry. People are hurting. People are watching us as believers. How do we respond? Holiness unto the Lord. In John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus is challenging the crowd there, and he's challenging you and me when he pointed out the fact that people are watching believers. And are they able to say, behold how they love one another? It's our privilege over the years to serve as an interim since, uh, uh, let me see, since 06 uh, through 19, and then since then we've been doing it on our own. We've been in some churches that the, the, it, was, it was pathetic. The people were angry. They wouldn't talk to each other. There were all kinds of issues. And, and they just absolutely refused to, to deal with issues and with each other. And we'd go in and it, I'd, I would ask around the community, Oh, that church! People watch us. Holding us into the Lord. Are they able to say about us and as a church, behold how they love one another. That is so extremely important. There's so many ways we can mess up. So many ways. During times of trials, I said, people will watch us as believers. I have a friend who loves, loves the Lord. I believe with all my heart loves people. Actually drove down to Florida one time from the northern part of the country just to lead a person to Christ. How, how good. But I also saw him one day. Was so angry. He owned a shop. He was so angry. He screamed and yelled at his son in front of the whole shop. Took his jacket off, threw it on the floor and stomped on it. Angry. 
embarrassing his son in, in, in front of all the employees. And then he'd said to me, Larry, I, I want you to go, I want you to witness to my employees. I want you to share the gospel. Can you imagine? I would try to share the gospel with them. And they looked at me and said, Larry, if that's a Christian, I want nothing to do with Christianity. Turn with me to Proverbs, would you, for just a quick moment here, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 22, Psalms, Proverbs, chapter 22. Give you a moment, me a moment to find it here. Proverbs 22, 24, and verses 24 and verses 25. All right, Proverbs chapter 22, verses 24 and 25. Make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man, do not go, lest he learn your ways and set a snare for your soul. Uh, and with a furious man, do not go, lest you learn his way. Contagious. It can be contagious. You hang around with people with a negative spirit, a critical spirit. Those who are gossiping, those who are angry, it can rub off on us. It can rub off on us. And so we need to be sure that we are not contributing to that type of a scenario at all. So God help us not to cause someone else to stumble or that we don't stumble as we depend on others. I give you five words out of the eight. What is that to you? What if others fail? What is that to us? Pastor friends, moral failure. I'll never forget how hard it was for multitudes when they found out about the life of Rabbi Zacharias. I'll not go on on that, but I think most of you know what happened there after his death, what took place. What an impact. I'll never forget the first time a friend of mine Actually, they called it moral failure, but it was just a, a fornication, adultery. Twice he took off with different church secretaries. That put my heart. If I'd have dwelled on that, I, I would have wiped out. But I, I had, it took a while, but I had to give that to the Lord and, 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 and come to the realization, what is that to you? Lord, Jesus said, follow me. Now, moving quickly. Now, secondly, consider the Lord's question. And, and this is very close. I know, I know that to the previous point. But consider the Lord's question if you've been hurt by another Christian. You know, there's a saying. I don't like it. But there's a saying. Christians are often the only ones who shoot their wounded. Some, you know, some believers seem so self-righteous. And, and many used to serve fervently who have been hurt by others. And their spiritual, you know, wreckage is strewn uh, along the, the paths of service. And that cripples the body of Christ. Appreciate what pastor is dealing there in, in 1 Corinthians and the gifts and how we as individuals are important in the body of Christ. There were careless tongues, gossip that, you know, ruined many a believer. In James chapter 3, verse 6, it says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. James chapter 3, verse 10 says, Out of the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Caustic tongues, gossip groups. You know, that's forbidden way back in Leviticus, as I referenced already, 1916. It tells us, do not, you know, do not be, you should not go about as a tarot bearer among the people. Forbidden. You know, there was a lady that knew she had a problem with, with gossip. She went to see the pastor one day, and he was a very wise pastor. He liked Pastor Dean, you know, very wise pastor. And so uh, he told this lady, he said, I want you to get a bag of feathers and go outside of town on, the, on a high hill, and I want you to wait till it's a windy day and throw those feathers out. So she did it. She came back a few days later and said, Pastor, what in the world was that all about? He said, now I want you to go out and pick up every one of those feathers. Get the point? I did it. Pick up the feathers. You know, once we gossip, we can't, we can't take it back. Proverbs 28, 18 says, A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club, sword, or a sharp arrow. I'm going to ask you to turn with me. It might seem unrelated, but I don't believe it is. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. We have Hebrews, James. Let's look very quickly at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. <clears throat> Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which one 
no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Pursue peace. The idea here is, is, is you know, stop the gossiping. Pursue peace. And it, he points out here that bitterness can replace blessing, and it will wound, could wound other believers. Many defiled. Some years ago, there was one very close to me, and I've shared this with some of you that are here this morning in the past, but there was, some, there was one very, 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 very close to me, had an unforgiving, bitter spirit. It, it, bitterness, indeed, it infected our entire family, and it was my mom. And she's been in heaven for a number of years now. She loved the Lord. But I was pastoring First Baptist Church in Holland, Michigan, and the phone rang. And I had confronted mom. Mom, I said, you have a bitter spirit. Oh, no. The phone rang. It was my mother. The first words out of her mouth were, son, I have a bitter spirit. I laid that phone down and I just wept. I wept. I picked it up and I said, praise God, mom. And it, it was a reality. She forgave. She dealt with her anger. And the bitterness dissipated. And it affected the rest of our family. You get the point? The rest of our family. When she dealt with that, things cleared up. You know, if she'd only applied our text to the situation, what is that to you? You follow me. That would have never happened in the first place. Now, thirdly, thirdly, consider the Lord's question and command. If you envy, you know, the, the, the last of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not covet. Maybe we could put the word envy in there as well. You know, if you envy another person's gifts or talents or positions, and I, I, I did this before, and I have to do it again. I have to confess. Okay, it's time to clear my conscience, all right? One thing that really frustrates me is tall, good-looking preachers that can sing. <laughs> I'm done. Oh, I'm clean. I'm clear. I'm going now, okay? Well, anyway, that's it. Seriously, remember back in John 21, 21, Peter looks over to John and says to Jesus, what about this man? Maybe Peter's question was sincere, but most likely a touch of envy. Lord, what is this man going to do? I'm going to die as a, mar a martyr's death. How about John, the beloved one who was writing this? He said, I'm going to feed sheep and some shepherds have to shovel manure and he is going to have to get his hands dirty and, and, and he was going to shepherd and, and, and he was going to shepherd people and that's not always easy. It's a privilege, but it's not always easy. You need to pray for your pastor. I'm going to feed sheep. Is he going to do something better, something greater than me? Let me ask you a question. Have we lost... God's best because of envy. Envious of someone's speaking ability. Envious, you know, you're, you coveted a position on, on the church board and you were denied, you were passed over. You worked at this, this business for a number of years and you were passed over for a promotion. You thought it should have been yours. You didn't get that raise you wanted to get. You, you, you wanted to really be out there on the basketball court. You wanted to be on the football field. And you didn't allow any of that stuff to happen. What is that to you? You follow me, Jesus said. You know, the scriptures tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. Envious of another speaking ability, position, success, money, attention. What is that to you? You follow me. Turn with me, would you, to uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That great love passage. And look at verse 4 and 5 with me. But just read it without comment. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. I guess I'll stop there. Love does not envy. Love does not covet. Now, look with me. Go back just one chapter to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. and verse 18, we read this. Now, God has set the members... He's referring to the, to the body, physically, and then the church, really. God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Now drop down with me, keeping that in mind. Look at verse 25. 
Well, put the members that it pleased him, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with that. We're to weep with those who weep. We're to rejoice with those who rejoice. You know, years of ministry, I've had thrill, I've had delight to be lifted up, to be loved on, to be cared for by others. A privilege to nurture others and just to be loved on. And what a blessing it's been. But it's also, I've been, I've been gossiped about. One day I was sitting in my study as I was pastoring uh, Calvary Memorial Church in Muskegon, Michigan. And this young lady came in, kind of a vivacious young lady, respected and loved by the church family. I never figured out yet what had taken place. But she walked in and she said, Pastor, if I wasn't so spiritual, I'd slap your face off. Boy, was I glad she was spiritual. But she, she was serious. But you know what happened? Praise God. Several years later, a little while later, she got right with the Lord, and they spent many years on the mission field. But, you know, the, the, the people are hurt. I don't know what, I still don't know after all these years what caused that. But I, I, I was able to give it to the Lord only by His grace and move on. You know, it could, could have really messed, messed me up. And it kind of, kind of reminds me, a lady walked up to the pastor one day and said, I don't like that tie. So he handed her a pair of scissors and, and she cut the tie off. He took the scissors back and he said, I don't like your tongue. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. God chooses to use people sometimes that we think have little to offer. We, we must not be coveting. We must not be jealous. We must realize that God has placed each of us in the body and given us the gifts that he has for us to use. Now, so we needed to use what God has given us. Remember Shamgar and the ox goat? How about Samson, the jawbone of a, of a donkey? David and, and, and a stone, a rock. Remember Mo, 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 Moses was a Moses was a, st a stutterer. The Bible says he had a speech impediment. He had a speech impediment. But did God use him? Oh my. Terrible speech impediment. Years ago, Hilda and I were driving through New England and we, we saw this sign in Northfield Mass. So we whipped off the road knowing this is where uh, D.L. Moody had, it, had, had, had his home and, and there was a woman's seminary that he had started there, a woman's uh, uh, a place to teach ladies. And so it was the off season. I think it was September, October, I forget. And we went into Northfield and we found out Moody's place there. And uh, usually they were guided tours and so on. Well, the curator and, and the, uh, the one who gave the tours was right there at, uh, at, Mo at the Moody's house. And so Hilda and I, we got this guided tour all by ourselves. And I actually had my privilege of standing uh, right behind Moody's desk and it was opened up original notes. I looked at them, and, oh my goodness. He butchered the king's English. His spelling was atrocious. It was terrible. God used him, didn't he? He gave what he had. He gave his all. He gave his all. God uses those, you know, the, again, we may think have little to offer. Some that we might think shorter brick. First Corinthians 1.27 says, not foolish people, but he says, I chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. The gospel to the world is, is, is foolishness. And, and I know this is sensitive areas, but try to illustrate how these things can sidetrack us and how sometimes we look at other people and we judge them and we do not know the motives. We do not know what is, what is uh, behind their problems. We do not know uh, how God could use people that he has used in a tremendous way. We look at others, again, it really shift gears here, and we allow them to, to drag, us, drag us down, or we drag down others. We've been hurt. We end, we end the others' positions and abilities and gifts God has given to them. Folks, it's time for us, it's time for us to face the Lord's command head on. These eight words, I believe with all of my heart, can change our lives, can sweeten our marriages, Stop the schism that's extended in many churches today. It can help deal with the pity party, the jealousy, the anger, the fear. It can help heal our hearts and deal with rejection, even in marital problems. 
What is that to you? You follow me. And oh, that we would permit others to use the word to encourage us and we in turn would encourage other people. I, I trust that you've been challenged so much this morning that we're to keep our eyes focused on the Lord Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Because all these other, just these three points, and there could be very many more that we've looked at, we could, we could become shipwrecked. We could become the excuse for someone else to maybe not come to Jesus or, or to not follow through on their commitment. God help us that we might be able, as, as Jesus said, as we're speaking to the crowd, they might look at us and they might say, behold, how they love one another. So just, again, don't allow circumstances by others or yourself to keep you from serving or trusting him. Obey Jesus in all these areas. Allow these eight words to be burned into our hearts. One more time, would you repeat them with me? What is that, I'm listening, what is that to you, you follow me? Now I'll close and turn the service back over to Pastor Dean in just a moment. Um, I appreciated Tom Joyce, just really did. He, he always makes a clear presentation of the gospel. I chatted with him about that this last week as he was speaking in an RV park. And he said, you know, Larry, if there's only one person in this crowd that come to Jesus, what a blessing that would be. You, know, you look out, most of those people are, are believers, but we never know. I have so many illustrations I could share. I'm just going to share this one. One day I was sitting in my office, and the chairman of the deacon board came in weeping. I said, Steve, what's, what's wrong, my friend? I said, go to my office. And we sat down, we chatted. As, as I told Pastor Dean, you know, kids are no, pastor's kids are no longer PKs, okay? They're TOs, theological offspring, okay? So Steve was a theological offspring. He was a pastor's kid. His dad had been pastoring for maybe, I don't know, 25, 30 years. That week, that week, his mother got saved. Can you believe that? And it shook Steve up so badly. Am I saved? Well, after we sat down, after 45 minutes or so of chatting, going through the scriptures, the Lord again gave him that peace that he had trusted Christ is resting in him. So I found out that I don't want to ever take it for granted. Are you sure of your relationship with the Lord Jesus this morning? Again, I know I've been addressing primarily believers that, you know, that the the need for our commitment and, and to keep our eyes focused on Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. But perhaps there's one here this morning even that you're not sure of your relationship with Christ. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and your heart with me right now. Would you do that as we pray and then we'll close and give it to Pastor Dean. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for that personal relationship we have with you. And Lord, uh, there may be someone out here even right now this morning, they're not sure of the relationship with Jesus. Father, I pray that you'd help on this right now. If, uh, folks, if you're not sure of your relationship with Christ, you know, you can nail it down right now. The Lord said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Someone asking if you're not sure of your relationship with Christ, you very simply right now pray with me, Lord Jesus. I know I'm a sinner, and I don't understand it all, but Lord, the best way I know how, right now I turn from my sin, and I trust you as my own personal Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Now I'm going to ask you, and we're not going to embarrass anybody, but I just, if you're not sure, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time, could I see your hand? Is there anybody in the auditorium? Could I see your hand? I want to pray for you in closing. Father, thank you for the opportunity to share the word today. Thank you that greater is he that's in us and he that's in the world. Thank you, Lord Jesus, so much for uh, for caring for us. Thank you for these, these, just these eight words that are so powerful. What is that to you? You follow me. May we be Christ followers in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor.
Russell just, just Christianity. Not on the basis of Jesus' teachings, but on the failure of his followers to follow his teachings. And again, man, maybe in hell, I don't keep the lens book away, but maybe in hell to this day, because he used the wrong criteria in deciding whether to come to Christ or not. We don't, we don't look at others and follow Christ based on whether others are consistent in their following Christ. Instead, we look to Jesus. And I appreciate Larry's message this morning because I know over the years we have had people that have left grace or have been disillusioned concerning Christianity or Christ because of other people. What is that to you? You follow me. Don't face what you do 